I'm George Weigel, the author of Witness to Hope and the End and the Beginning, both published in new Polish editions by Wydrodze, the publishing house of the Dominicans in Poland, the Order of Preachers, Polish province, for whom I'm very grateful, and it's on their behalf that I'm speaking to you today. Uh, I'd like to talk here a bit about the social doctrine of John Paul II, his thinking on the free society of the 21st century and the third millennium. Catholic social doctrine is one of the most interesting bodies of thought on offer in the world today. In its papal form, Catholic social doctrine begins in 1891 with Pope Leo XIII. Pope Leo XIII wanted Catholicism to renew itself, to reform itself, to renovate its mind, to convert the modern world. The world was not as it had been. The Industrial Revolution, urbanization, mass education, the new forms of economic life, uh, the new forms of political life in a world after monarchy, all of these required a response from the Catholic Church, Pope Leo believed. And in 1891, he issued the encyclical Rerum Novarum, whose very title, New Things, uh, reflects his attempt to offer a Christian reflection on society, culture, politics, and economics and to do so in, in what I would call a vocabulary and a grammar that everyone could engage and discuss. Catholic social doctrine is, in its classic form, articulated in the vocabulary and grammar of the natural moral law, by which we mean that there are truths about how we should live, how we should live together, that are built into the world and into us. We can know those truths by reason, and those truths become a kind of grammar uh, by which we can have a serious public discussion about the great question of public life, which is, of course, how ought we to live together. Leo XIII, in Rerum Novarum, articulated two fundamental principles or building blocks, foundation stones, of Catholic social doctrine. First, what we call the principle of personalism, or in a 21st century vocabulary, we might call the human rights principle. What does that teach? It teaches that everyone is a someone. Everybody is a somebody with a distinct identity, intelligence, free will, built-in human dignity, and that each of us has a vocation to exercise that dignity in cooperation with others in order to build up society, culture, political and economic life. And all right thinking, thinking correctly about society, culture, politics and economics, according to this personalist principle, begins with that dignity of the human person. We don't begin with the ethnic group, the tribal group, the racial group, the gender group. We begin with the built-in dignity and value of every human person. Everybody is a somebody. But because everybody is a somebody who ought to live that vocation of human dignity in a way that it enhances society as a whole, uh, there is a second complementary foundational principle in Catholic social doctrine, according to Leo XIII, and that is the principle of the common good or what we might say, we're all in this together. Uh, I should exercise my rights 
in such a way that they lead not simply to my fulfillment, but to the enhancement, the development, the well-being of society as a whole. No man is an island, the English poet John Donne said. That's one way of thinking about the principle of the common good. We're not simply autonomous individual selves ricocheting around the world like the balls on a billiard table. Uh, we are in this together. A third principle in the classic social doctrine of the Catholic Church was cemented into that foundation by Pope Pius XI in 1931, the 40th anniversary of Leo XIII's great encyclical, when in the encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, Pope Pius XI uh, defined the principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity. What did he mean by that? Well, let's think of the date, 1931. Italian fascism has been in power for almost nine years. German National Socialism is on the rise. Bolshevism has taken over Russia. The totalitarian project, whether it's fascist, Nazi, or communist form, seemed to be on the rise throughout the world. And what was totalitarianism? Well, Benito Mussolini, the Italian fascist leader, defined it in these terms. What did the totalitarian project mean? Everything within the state, everything for the state, nothing outside the state. That's a rather grim view of the human condition, but that totalitarianism seemed to some in the early 1930s to be the wave of the future. It was more efficient. Pius XI said no. Pius XI said that a properly ordered society has many levels of authority. Let me take an example from the United States, where I come from. There is a national government, there are state governments, there are county governments, there are city governments. There are levels of political authority. And decision-making in a properly ordered society, according to Pius XI, should be at the lowest possible level, at the level closest to the people affected by the decision. So that in, let's say again, the American context, you don't ask the national government to run the local fire department. That can be done locally. By the same token, you don't ask the local fire department to be responsible for national defense. That, that's a national level uh, responsibility. So a richly textured, multi-layered uh, public space is what the principle of subsidiarity envisions. And it's that principle of subsidiarity that inoculated the Catholic Church from the totalitarian temptation the totalitarian temptation that, as Mussolini put it again, everything is within the state, everything is for the state, nothing is outside the state. John Paul II cemented a fourth principle into the foundations of social doctrine, of Catholic social doctrine, the principle of, of solidarity, which means, I think, in a more... Uh, 21st century vocabulary, the principle of civic friendship. The free society of the 21st century, John Paul II knew, had to be based on a sense of mutual responsibility that was deeper than legal responsibility. If all we know about each other, if our only relationship to each other in society is how we can take each other to court. If it's merely a legal relationship to my neighbor, that is simply an insufficient texture by which to sustain the free society. 
civic friendship, a sense of mutual responsibility, is essential to the free society of the future. Here in Poland, over the past two years, I'm speaking to you, of course, in the late spring of 2024, this principle of solidarity has been lived magnificently by the way the Polish people have opened themselves to the needs of their Ukrainian neighbors who have fled to Poland after the Russian invasion of February 2022. That's an expression of solidarity. That's an expression of civic friendship that makes the free society possible. Now, John Paul II made other contributions to the social doctrine of the church that are worth noting. First, in the encyclical Laborum Exercens, 1981, on human work, John Paul II taught that work is our participation in God's ongoing creation of the world. According to the Christian understanding, creation did not end on the sixth day, what the book of Genesis calls the sixth day, after which God takes a little break on the seventh day called the Sabbath. No, God continues to create the world, for as St. Thomas Aquinas taught in the 13th century, if God wanted to end the world, God would not have to do something, God would have to stop doing something. God's creation, God's creativity, God's sustaining creativity, if you will, extends throughout history. Our work, our building up of the world through our work, is our participation in God's ongoing creation of the world, according to John Paul II in the encyclical Laborum Exercens. And when we identify our work and its hardship, because work can be hard, with the work of Christ, with the suffering of Christ, with the redemptive work of Christ, then our work participates in Christ's ongoing redemption of the world. So in the understanding of John Paul II, work is not simply a way to make a living. Work is a participation in God's sustaining creativity of the world. Work is our participation in Christ's redemptive action in the world. It was 10 years later in the encyclical Centesimus Annus of 1991 that John Paul II gave voice to what I believe is the most comprehensive expression of Catholic social doctrine uh, over the 125 years of the history of papal social teaching. In the encyclical Centesimus Annus, John Paul II taught many important things. Let me just highlight a few of them. First, the free and virtuous society, as John Paul II understood it, had three interlocking component parts. Think of three rings interlocking in the middle. A free polity, meaning a democratic political system. A free economy, meaning one that is driven primarily by the market, not by the state. But most importantly, a vibrant public moral culture. The cultural system, the third part of the free and virtuous society, is the most important. Free politics and free economics let loose tremendous human energies. What is going to discipline and direct those energies so that the result is the flourishing of individual human persons and social solidarity? That's what the public moral culture is intended to do, is supposed to do, and it's the primary task of the church to form that public moral culture. So three interlocking parts, again, no totalitarianism, three interlocking parts, democratic political community, market-centered economy, vibrant public moral culture. Secondly, 
John Paul II teaches in Centesi Musanus that democracy and the market are not machines that can run by themselves. It's not sufficient to simply build a correctly constructed political community or a correctly constructed economy. You stick the key in, you turn the ignition on, and everything runs properly. That's not the way it works, John Paul II insisted. It takes a certain critical mass of people living certain virtues in order to make the machinery of democracy and the market function properly. That's a crucial lesson for the 21st century when far too many political and economic theorists think of politics and economics simply in mechanical terms. Get the machinery right and everything else will follow. That's not true. It takes a certain kind of people, a certain critical mass of people, living certain virtues, honesty, integrity, fair dealing, willingness to take prudent risks, willingness to compromise in the public space to make political and economic freedom work. Third, in Chintesimus Honest, John Paul II teaches that freedom is not a matter of the will so much as it is a matter of reason. Willfulness as freedom is a great misunderstanding throughout the Western world today, uh, perhaps symbolically uh, captured in the song by that great moral philosopher, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Well, I did it my way is a pretty childish understanding of freedom. That's what a two-year-old thinks. I want to do it my way. I want something. I want it now. I want it my way, and I'm going to make a lot of trouble if I don't get it. Um, freedom understood in a mature, adult, noble sense, as John Paul II teaches, is doing the right thing, which we can know by reason, for the right reason, with the right intention, and doing it as a matter, matter of moral habit. As, a vir as virtue grows in us over, over our lives, we learn to live our freedom more nobly. So we're not just saying, I did it my way. We're saying, I did the right thing in the right way for the right reason, so that my fulfillment and my service to others uh, is enhanced. Freedom is not willfulness. In Chintesi Masonis, John Paul II also taught something very important about the nature of wealth and the nature of poverty. Wealth in the post-industrial information technology world is a matter of human creativity. It's not just stuff in the ground. Silicon was stuff in the ground for billions of years. It was worthless until somebody figured out how to make a microchip. And the whole IT revolution developed from the application of creativity, imagination, to stuff, the silicon chip. And there was a great explosion of wealth out of it. If wealth is creativity, if the wealth of nations, to quote Adam Smith, resides not in stuff in the ground or in owning the ground, but in the application of human creativity and intelligence to the material world, then poverty means exclusion from those networks of creativity and productivity where wealth is created and sustained and shared. So anti-poverty programs should be programs of empowerment, empowering people to unleash that creativity that is built uh, into them. This Catholic social doctrine is very important in a world in which freedom is misunderstood as autonomy or willfulness, 
in which the pursuit of wealth is often detached from the common good, in which rights are understood as something we get from the state rather than something that is built into us, that is inherent or inalienable within us. Living freedom nobly is essential to sustaining free societies. The Catholic social doctrine that begins with Leo XIII and that reaches its perhaps highest form of development in John Paul II is an essential part of the conversation about the human future. Thank you. Dziękujemy, że wspierasz Dominikanie.pl. Potrzebujemy Twojego wsparcia.